Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm Roth Michaels. I'm a principal software engineer at Native Instruments. And um, before we get into the t uh, main topic of the talk today, I wanted to um, take a little aside to talk about something else um, that I was actually first inspired to talk about many years ago before I ever spoke at a conference. The first conference I went to, there's a group called Include C++, which if you're not familiar with it, they have an awesome Discord, a great place to ask questions. They held a panel on uh, diversity and inclusion, and someone asked a question about hiring and other things like this. And near the end, someone asked, like, well, what can we do to try to make the C++ community a more inclusive and diverse place? And one of the panelists had an answer that I really liked, which was, um, you know, all these talks go up on YouTube. And you can use this as a platform to talk about what's important to you. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. Even though I'm not some famous YouTube guy, I'm just Roth, who's never given a talk, I want to start doing this. So I started doing it at work. And then I got into conference talks, was too busy preparing, and never remembered to do that until this year. So I want to just kind of uh, mention that, you know, if you've never given a talk, probably lots of people here have learned something interesting and have something to share. And so don't think being a speaker is some kind of um, magical crown that I wear or anyone else here. You know, I encourage anyone to. Um, apply to give talks at conferences, or maybe even at the open mic tonight if there's uh, still room. So you can do it. And this was a mid-journey picture trying to uh, be an alien, Rosie the Riveter. Um, I need to get better at prompting because maybe it's more of an Uncle Sam thing. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> so as I said, I work at Native Instruments. And actually, this story about uh, physical units and quantities started in my journey at Isotope before we merged together in this big family of Native Instruments, Plugin Alliance, Isotope, and Brainworks. Uh, you don't need this slide because I think people here know what plugins are. Um, this is the uh, uh, talk I've given before. And um, yeah, about me, I've studied music composition, uh, uh, programmed my own tools, uh, many years writing uh, C and Baldo Swift, and at work have done a lot of um, work developing kind of artisanal um, ways of approaching units. So, why do we care about units in our code? Here's one kind of simple example. This is not a great API. I mean, so, all right, is this gain in decibels or zero to one? Maybe there's a comment. Maybe it says gain dB. You probably have to look at the code to find out. That's, in a nutshell, why we need units. But they're um, important for a lot of other reasons. The classic example is um, crashing really expensive Mars landers by mixing up uh, imperial and metric. Oh, actually, in this case, yeah, it was pounds four seconds versus newton seconds, um, and that made some mistake, and it uh, ended up missing Mars instead of landing on it. Um, and another reason it uh, matters is, like I said, you know, we have these mistakes in audio. When I was first starting an isotope, I was working on a feature, um, this button here, adding a little crossfade to it, and the DSP was so slow in debug, I couldn't actually hear it on my own machine because it made about one buffer per few seconds. But a QA engineer had a release build locally next to me, so. I said, okay, I've added this, but you test it out. I went to go get a coffee, I come back, and he very politely said, hey, Roth, is this supposed to make any sound? And yes, it was, but I, I, I thought I did this definitely right, but 35 milliseconds ended up as 35 seconds uh, crossfade. <laughs> and it's important for a lot of other reasons. You make these kind of mistakes, not just, oh, did it not make any sound? You could uh, damage people's ears, damage people's speakers, or have crashes or other bugs in live performance. So, this stuff is really important. And, I, and we kind of had some internal um, ways that we kind of tried to deal, deal with some of this, but I was looking for you know, open source solutions. I tried looking at boost units before, but it, um, I, yeah, I gave up. Uh, um, but I eventually found my way to this library, uh, MP units, which is kind of the theme of the talk for today. And so my interest in this started with actually a proposal by uh, Timur, whose spot I'm filling in for, uh, who's a new dad that uh, couldn't make it today. But a number, a few years ago, he wrote a paper uh, it's proposing a standard audio proposal for C++. And my own reaction, other people's in the industry, was, well, we don't really need all this infrastructure for like hardware audio callbacks and all this stuff. But we do want, you know, we could use some stuff, like stood chrono is really nice. We could use other vocabulary types like buffers and other things we use in audio. So I started talking with various people about this. And if we had, you know, stood chrono seconds, it'd be really nice if we could have hertz and samples and things like this as well. So I started looking around. I found this MP Unis library and a proposal from a few years ago, uh, C, um, P1935, to see if the C++ um, industry was interested in this. And um, there's another interesting library, AU, but it was not out at the time. Um, so we're talking about MP Unis today. So. Um, one question a lot of my coworkers asked me are, is a physical units library for us? Because we're not dealing with the like um, scientific units that you know you normally see. You know, our units aren't these physical units, and these libraries, maybe they won't do what we need for samples or quarter notes or pulse per quarter or things like this. But 
And actually, they will work for our industry, I think, because it's not just about physical quantities and units. That's just the kind of term that ISO uses when they define things like SI. It's the physical units and quantities standard. But um, you can really use these libraries for any kind of units. The one issue at the moment um, that not all libraries deal with well is nonlinear units, like decibels. We'll kind of get back to that a little bit later. And also, there's another question of like, well, yeah, we, what if we use all these great typed units in our code, but the VST API or the AU API still just gives us a bag of floats that we have to deal with? And so how do we approach that? So we'll uh, cover all these topics. So um, very briefly, just kind of show you how this MPUnis library works. Um, you, if you want to see a kind of in-depth uh, tutorial of it, uh, Mateusz, uh, who uh, was the original author of the library, has a great talk here you can check out, which he goes into much more detail. Um, and uh, this is um, another talk that was given recently about this other units library, which is a little talk on MP units in here as well. Um, this, how did it work? Oh, no, this is right. This is the, the warning that um, this is into the slide where um, a lot of things on here probably should be const explorer in line. Uh, anything that is not having a namespace is in the MP units namespace for this library. And you'll see NI and uh, TP for example code for like first party NI or third party uh, TP example code. So um, very basically, this is how it uh, works. If you wanted to make a um, quantity V1 that was 100 kilometers per hour, you just write 100 times kilometers divided by hours. Or if you wanted miles per hour, you do 70 times miles per hour. And if you imagine that multiplication sign kind of disappearing, this is exactly how you would write this stuff out by hand which is a really nice feature of the library. We're not using constructors to do this stuff. You just write it out just like you would write the math on paper. And you'll see these things. Um, if you were to print these, um, you would get values like this. And you can have APIs that um, you can call with things like that are a distance. Um, so this speed API, we could, you know, it could be a template like this where it could take any types and divide them. Uh, but really, you know, if it's an average speed function, we don't want to take um, number of cats divided by meters. We want some measure of distance over a measure of time. So we can make this more specific by saying we're going to take, for the first argument, anything that's a measure of length. We could, it could be kilometers. It could be meters. It could be, we could define our own, uh, how many Roths long is this? Um, and then it takes uh, time as the second argument. And you see, you know, it will do the correct conversion. So if you pass in kilometers and hours, the type you get out is kilometers over hours. And you have some more examples of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through some of these examples um, because this is a slightly shorter uh, duration than the last time I gave this talk. But I want all the slideware to be there so you can kind of go back and reference it. So um, when looking at this unit stuff internally, one of my colleagues asked me the question, are units real? And yes and no. If you look at this, you know, force times mass times acceleration, what is real here is the relationship between those quantities, the mass, that mass times acceleration equals force. What we've made up as humans is that we measure mass in kilograms. So that's one of the other important features of this library compared to other things like boost units. It's not just about adding units to things, but actually specifying a quantity first, like length. And then you can measure length in any sort of unit you want, like uh, light years, kilometers, miles, feet, uh, as you wish. Uh, and this is kind of a definition of a quantity from the ISO. Um, standard on quantities and units, that it's some uh, phenomenon, body, or substance where a property has a magnitude that can be expressed as a number and a reference, and that reference can be a measurement unit. So basically, quantities are things that we count, and the units de uh, determine what unit, what thing we're counting that in. Um, so uh, a length is um, a quantity, and we can count that in a number of inches that it has, for example. And uh, quantities have uh, relationships between each other. So for example, uh, all of these are kinds of lengths, but you'll see that a height is not a width, for example. And um, a diameter is a type of width, but it's not a height. And so one of the other kind of powerful features of this library is the ability to um, be more specific than just length and uh, have type conversions go either way. Because you can imagine you can pass a width to a length, but you can't pass a height to a width. And so a little example of this, uh, if we have a square prism class that takes a constructor that's a width and a height, um, we can <coughs> uh, store those in meters, and then we can um, correctly not mix up those arguments when we're passing those functions. 
And it can actually work kind of a couple of different ways, you see, because I can actually explicitly say I'm passing width and height to be safe. But if I want to use a shorthand, I can actually say, oh, no, just one meter by one meter. I don't really care which is which. Uh, both actually work in this library. And you'll see here there's some other notations for uh, if we want to actually explicitly cast. So like you'll see that we're creating a, um, even though the first argument's a width, we can actually coerce a height to be a width because we say we're doing the right thing. And as that kind of all follows along that tree, you can um, freely convert up, and you have to cast if you want to go down. Um, another kind of interesting thing that comes up sometimes when people think about units is like scaling things by a unit. For example, let's say we wanted to grow this prism, and we wanted to grow it by a certain amount of um, width and a certain amount of height. Uh, so we you know, have this ratio, we pass this in, but there's really no way to tell which is which in this case because meters divided by meters is unit list. And so um, that's something to keep in mind is that we're dealing with APIs that scale something. You actually might not have a unit for that, and you need to maybe design a better API than passing two. This is really just like passing two floats so or two doubles. So really, in a case like this, you might want to design your API um, to be more clear when you're using uh, something to scale. So let's get into why we're actually here today, uh, digital audio. So um, as you know, we're off mostly operating on floats. And so that's kind of a key feature of this MPUnits library. Like standard chrono, you get to pick what your representation type is. A lot of units libraries might actually just always use double underneath, which has two downsides. One, you're wasting the this, this time and space on doubles, as well as um, if you're always converting things to doubles internally, you might also be always losing the kind of units you have. So you don't want to have any kind of unnecessary conversions, because if we sort of adopt in these strongly typed units in your algorithm, you don't want to actually change the behavior or performance characteristics just because you use new types. So this needs to work exactly the same as if it was floats. And when you deal with third-party APIs, it might give us stuff like um, float and unsigned. And um, I think everyone in this room might be familiar with this, but um, um, modulation rate we often talk about as hertz in this industry. According to ISO, those are actually modulation rate is a different unit than hertz, but they're inter interchangeable for us. So the rest of the talk, we can use hertz in a few different ways. So uh, for the first example we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at musical tempo. Um, if you, this, I thought the other example was first, but we'll get into this one anyway. Sorry about that. Um, so um, you know, people are used to seeing musical notation like this, and we can. And if you are not familiar, when we're dealing with MIDI or in the DAW, often the way our uh, note durations are laid out is there are a number of pulses per quarter note. Um, is usually 960, I think, or sometimes in older systems, uh, 480. So it would be great if, when we're dealing with uh, musical time, that we don't have to. Um, you know, do all the math conversions you might do today to actually say, okay, the, the host tempo is 110 BPM, and I want a quarter note duration event to happen. How do I figure out how to turn that into seconds? And today we would do all of that math by hand. But uh, this actually, this library allows us to define our own new types uh, for dealing with time. So there's um, a, in this example, we're going to first define a, um, this first line this where we're making this struct that inherits from quantity spec. This is a way that we define a new kind of quantity. So the first uh, kind of layer of building up our ability to uh, measure time in quarter notes is we say, okay, we're going to have a quantity that's a count of beats. So we might have seven beats. And then we might have a beat duration, and that is something that is a, uh, you see the top one, B count is dimensionless. It's just a number of things we're counting. And a beat duration, we're saying that's a kind of time. And then we can define tempo as a type of frequency that we measure as a beat count over time. And then we can uh, define other uh, units, like a quarter note, as, um, in this case, we're calling quarter notes always the beat. Music doesn't always work that way, but for this example. So we can say um, quarter notes. We can represent those with a Q, and we'll say that's a unit that's a kind of beat. Uh, and then if we want to say a whole note, we can describe that as okay, a whole note is four quarter notes. And oh, I forgot, I highlighted this stuff. Um, and you'll see, uh, as we go through um, this, we can you know, create all sorts of different um, durations of notes. Um, note, I've called out the noticing using this ratio here, is that's how we would um, because of how this library works, we have to use multiply always here for um, defining these new units. So 
to have an eighth note be half a quarter note, you have to multiply it by a ratio of one over two. The divide by two syntax just at the moment uh, doesn't work in the library. And then we can make shorthand um, types for all of these um, things we define, like dotted half, half note, et cetera, so that in our code we don't have to write out dotted half, but we could just say um, four times n underscore hd for four dotted half notes, for example. And you can specify these, you know, um, you see most of the examples were other units I had specifically defined, but we can also just kind of make shorthand types for anything. If, oh, I want a special thing for um, three half notes, um, you can do it like this as well. And so um, let's look at what this would look like with um, integrating with a third party library. So, um, and just as a aside, so all these kind of unit symbols I defined here, I brought those into the namespace in these other uh, examples. So imagine we have some third party API for interacting with a DAW that gives us a tempo as a float. We can get um, the amount of pulse per quarter notes the DAW is using as an unsigned integer. And we can get the transport position as uh, another unsigned integer, which is the number of uh, quarter note pulses since the start of the uh, track. And so if we are getting this from a API like VST3 or something like this, how would we uh, make it so it's safe for our client code that we write to not deal with floats, but actually get a BPM out of the VST API instead? And the way we do this is we essentially write our own wrapper that we call instead of calling the uh, host APIs directly. And you'll see for git tempo, uh, we want that to return a quantity that's a beats per minute, and then we want to keep the type as float. And the way we do that is we just call the git tempo and we multiply it by our beats per minute unit, and now that converts the raw float that we had into a strongly typed beats per minute float. And we can do the same thing with pulse per quarter. You multiply it by MIDI pulse per quarter note, and we get a, um, a unsigned uh, pulse per quarter, and the same thing for the transport position. And now you can kind of safely use these within um, your code, and you're no longer calling the host APIs directly, and now you will always kind of get these uh, nice types in your code, and uh, you don't have to worry about getting the math right. It will just do it for you, and if you want to know, okay, I need 100 beats into something, you can just kind of figure that all out this way. And uh, so you can see some ways that we might use this. Um, we can, if you imagine a reverb, uh, where the reverb time is not being controlled in milliseconds or seconds, but you want the reverb time uh, controlled with the tempo, so that you might say, I want to half note long reverb tail. And as the tempo changes, you want, as the tempo um, uh, reduces, the reverb tail gets longer. And as the tempo increases, the reverb tail would get shorter. And um, just a show of hands uh, for this audience, I'm assuming um, people can imagine what I'm talking about, about a host synced uh, tempo parameter. Is everyone kind of on board with specifying reverb in um, beats per minute? OK. Uh, I have a sound example, but I want to make sure we uh, have time for questions. So I, I believe you that. Um, you will, I, I trust that you believe me that if I turn down the tempo, reverb gets longer. Uh, so the way we would actually, no, so normally in you know, a lot of our production code, we did this math by hand, had to make sure to get it right. But using a units library, this actually looks at, um, becomes much nicer. So first we call our uh, git tempo that we uh, previously wrote here that gives us our nice uh, beats per minute type. And all these comments will show what would print if you printed out uh, that type. So if we printed out tempo, we'd see it's 110 BPM. And if we wanted to get a reverb time that's one uh, quarter note long, uh, we would time it. We would say, OK, we want one uh, quarter note. Um, that was the shorthand quarter note I just defined earlier. And you'll see if we print that, it's one quarter note. And then if I want to actually figure out what reverb time in seconds to pass my reverb algorithm, I just take the uh, reverb beats divided by the tempo, and that gives me seconds. And the reason for that is that a BPM is a um, number of quarter notes um, per minute, or per time. So it's number of beats per time. And then we have a um, number of beats. And so when we divide those, the beats cancel out, and we get a time. And, um, and we'll get that uh, correct number every time. And then you'll, we'll see if we want to um, do a similar thing for transport position. Uh, we can get the pulse per quarter used by the host. In this case, I cast it to a float um, pulse per quarter, because the host API is maybe giving me unsigned. But I wanted to make sure all my other math I do is all going to be floating point math, so I can convert that to a float. 
I get my transport position. So we see the transport position is a little over 15,000 pulses at this moment. And if I want to figure out uh, how many beats into my track we are at that position, we can take that transport position, divide it by the pulses per quarter note, and uh, that will give us the beats. And you've noticed at the end I say in quarter notes, that uh, is what converts it from uh, the result of the transport position divided by pulse per quarter, which would actually be um, a number of quarter note pulses, and say we want to convert quarter note pulses to quarter notes. So um, I could also have used that to say like in seconds or something like this. And you see actually that's exactly what we do on the bottom line is we take the, the beats uh, divided by tempo, and we would say we want to convert that into um, seconds by using the NS. Is there any questions about this before I move on? Of course, we'll take questions at the end, but I just want to make sure people were following along, because uh, um, <laughs> there's more coming. And if you were lost, uh, you might get lost again on the next example. So um, the main motivation for me to start exploring this uh, topic of quantities in units was um, digital sample time. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, in C++17, we got a uh, standard chrono uh, that allows us to specify durations and time points and safely do math on them. And now I won't get mixed up and forget my, how to do math and end up with 35 mm -hmm. seconds instead of 35 milliseconds. Um, but as soon as we want to then convert that into a number of digital samples into the track, we're back into doing math by hand again. And we have to trust ourselves as humans uh, not to make a mistake. And Another unit we're dealing with often also is the actual uh, amplitude value of those samples as well that we usually kind of think of as this unit list zero to one thing in DSP, but that we'll find that also is useful to have a unit attached to that as well. So uh, first, let's look at how we would actually specify, um, you know, it, if we would like uh, standard chrono duration, how would we end up with something like that for the sample count? Um, we see this is very similar to the beats example. We start off with defining a new quantity that's dimensionless. So dimensionless just means it's a number of things we're counting. Um, uh, for example, like if we wanted to define a quantity as um, number of people in a room um, that we wanted to use to count here, that's also a dimensionless thing. It's, it's just we're counting things. Uh, and then we can create a sample duration by saying that that's a kind of time. And so that's um, going back to this chart. That's you know, between those two black lines, how much does, uh, in time does each sample take up? And then a sampling rate, uh, again, similar to our pulse per quarter, this is a type of frequency, and we specify the sampling rate as a type of frequency quantity by saying it's the number of samples uh, divided by time. And then we can define a new unit uh, for this sample time that in this case I'm calling sample uh, and abbreviating it SMPL, and so we could use this now to say, you know, if I want to specify, you know, 44,100 uh, uh, samples for one second on a CD, uh, instead of that being a raw number now, I can actually write uh, 44,100 times um, one sample. And so let's look again about how we would adapt the kind of some DAW API uh, to deal with this. So the DAW is probably going to give us the current sampling rate as a float. Uh, and so again, we're just going to wrap this up into a safe type saying that, okay, we want to get the sample rate, um, multiply it by the scientific notation um, hertz, and then you know, that's going to return. The, so that um, expression, get sample rate times hertz, that's just returning a normal frequency hertz. But you see the return type, I'm a little bit more specific in saying, no, this isn't just any hertz. This is specifically a sample rate in hertz uh, so that you, know, you couldn't um, use the result of this function, for example, for a oscillator frequency. Because uh, it's saying this is specifically, even though we're using hertz as a unit, this is specifically a sample rate. And this is going back to where I said quantities are really important, not just the units, because hertz can mean all sorts of different things. But here, we want to make sure we don't mix this up with any other use of hertz and only use it for sample rate. And then here's what it's uh, like to use. Very nice. So we say get sample rate. It might return something like, uh, 44, 100, and it would be in hertz. Uh, you can see also we can uh, define a sample rate as uh, 48,000 times samples over seconds. And so we kind of use samples over seconds or hertz, both as units for a sample rate. We can come up with a number of samples for a buffer size by doing like 512 times SMPL. And then if we wanted to understand, OK, we have a 512 sample buffer. How much time is that? Well, uh, similar to our beats example, we just would take our samples 
divide it by the sampling rate and say, okay, we want this value in seconds. And you see what would print out below. And similarly, if we wanted to take our um, second sample rate, the SR2, and get it in milliseconds, we divide sample, there are 512 samples divided by SR2 and get it in milliseconds. And the thing I want to point out here is you'll notice SR1 is hertz and SR2 is samples per second. But because um, samples per second is also um, defined as a uh, type of frequency here when we define the sampling rate, both samples per second and hertz both work interchangeably as a sampling rate. And so that's why we kind of use either uh, one there. And then if we wanted to find the duration of a single sample at um, our sampling rates, instead of dividing a, the buffer of 512 by that, we can just uh, divide by one, and that would give us our sample durations. And then as far as the amplitude of the samples, we can kind of set up a similar thing. You kind of notice a similar pattern. We start off with our dimensionless unit for the number of samples. Uh, and then this is where it gets a little bit interesting because we might want to actually um, specify a few uh, different ways of looking at this. So um, we might want to, we use uh, amplitude and level both to refer to the, the non-negative value of a sample. Um, and then we can convert that to a power by saying a power is a level times a level. Um, and then we also might want to be able to say that the uh, have a type that is a the actual sample value, so not just the magnitude or the level, but whether it's the positive or negative sample value. And so um, when I make the sample value, this named unit PCM, I'm saying that's a named unit for the um, positive or negative uh, sample values. And then you can see I can define some shorthands for sample and sample value as SMPL and uh, PCM. And so there's a couple of things that are kind of interesting to think about here is how we deal with the non-negative uh, quantities and units. And this is actually still an open question that's being discussed. Uh, don't worry about looking at all this stuff uh, here. I'm, uh, what was I even trying to overwhelm you with? Uh, it's even too small for me to see. But um, oh, yes, OK. This is. <laughs> This is example code you can look at later about how to specify a non-negative unit. Uh, uh, um, download the slides and you can read that. Um, but in short, you'll see that this, um, uh, we, this, we're using this non-negative um, thing. We've uh, this validated type here. We create this non-negative. And now this allows us to say that we have a sample power quantity that's a quantity of power, uh, which is specifically a non-negative sample value. Um, this is a bit mysterious. Don't worry about it. We're kind of still iterating on what this should look like in the library. Um, but you can look at these examples later for kind of how you would create non-negative uh, values. And the uh, reason you would want to do this is things like uh, it's OK to have a sample value in PCM that's uh, you know, negative 4 times sample value. So we have negative 4 PCM. And if we square that, uh, we'll get 0.16 uh, PCM squared, which is power. and that's um, totally fine, but the downside, but you'll see if we actually um, try to create a sample power quantity that we've defined above as non-negative in purple here by explicitly saying we want a negative 0.2 power, um, that would be a compiler error because power doesn't make sense as a non-negative number, as a negative number, because there's no way to go from a negative power back to a level because you can't do the square root of a negative number, so power always has to be non-negative. Uh, one of the open questions here, and if anyone wants to chat afterwards about ideas, I'd be more than welcome to talk about it, is even though the actual quantity of a power value shouldn't be negative, you might still want it to be negative to do math on it, because there's uh, other good advice we often have in C++ not to use unsigned integers for math, but always use signed types, because um, you, you know, when you're doing math on things, you're allowed to have negative numbers, and so if you're calculating maybe the difference between two sample values, uh, two sample powers, you, should, you shouldn't really need to worry about, okay, do I put the big value minus the small value in your math equations? Hopefully, you can do math on this stuff all fine, but somehow we need to make it safe to, at some point, be sure that our power values are non-negative. And uh, there's a GitHub issue, if anyone's interested, I can show you that there's a lot of discussion on this, and it's kind of an open question of research in the library, what the best way to handle 
uh, non-negative or other constrained values, like you might imagine, um, you know, uh, uh, a measurement in radians, maybe you want that to wrap around at 2 pi instead of going up to 4 pi or something, for example. And an even bigger open question in this library is how do we deal with um, logarithmic units like decibels? And this is actually what kind of motivated me to get involved with this project is this is an open question. Uh, most uh, of these uh, units libraries out there don't really have an approach for this at all. And there are some that do, but um, decibels are actually kind of a complex thing because first of all, they involve logarithms, so they're nonlinear. And so that's something that's kind of very different than all this kilometers, beats, other stuff that I'm showing you that had very simple linear relationships. Uh, it's more than just um, about handling logarithms. We'll see in a second the decibels, their reference, and what they're measuring also is very important. And there's this question of, like, should um, the library allow you to do any sort of nonlinear um, transformations? Or um, and should this be like some like customization point that you can say my unit is you know, related to this other thing by my own weird nonlinear function. I would say no, that we probably don't need full customization for arbitrary nonlinear relationships in our libraries. But if we support uh, logarithmic relationships, then that would cover most of our bases. Unfortunately, in the standard, um, log isn't const expert, which causes us other problems with this library. But, and again, this is another area of open research, actually, how we'll approach uh, decibels. But I can show you kind of some of my thoughts about this. Um, and so one of the things to keep in mind about uh, most decibel values is they're a measurement of something in relation to some reference. And so um, we'll go into the, the um, analog audio world for a moment and uh, talk about uh, uh, dBU and dBV as uh, measurements of uh, electric potential in volts. So we see if we have a value um, U0 that's 0.775 volts and U1 that's 1, um, and that's kind of our units, our references. So uh, dBU, the reference value is 0.775 volts. Uh, dBV, the reference value is one volt. And we'll see if we want to actually convert a uh, voltage value, V1 or V2, into a decibel value. We would use this equation for 20 times uh, log 10 of our value divided by the reference. And a couple things you might notice here. Uh, Um, we're doing this division here of the volts divided by the reference. Everywhere else, when I said we did division, all of a sudden we lose the units. So volts divided by volts is just a number. But that's not how it works with decibels. So we actually need to know that this is not just any old decibel value. This is specifically dBU. So somehow it needs to bring along with it not only the reference value, which would be similar to like a time point versus a duration in standard chrono, we also need to keep track that this is not just any decibels. It's not decibel meters. It's not dBFS in the digital realm. This is specifically dBU, because below, when we use the other reference value, we need to somehow bring this reference value along to say that, OK, D, um, dBV1 and dBV2 are quantities of decibel dBV, not dBU. And a note, none of this code will compile at the moment. This is, or I mean, this would probably, yeah, well, no one compile at the moment, but my point is um, this is not support the library, but kind of my dreams of what it probably should look like when you're dealing with decibels. And so as I mentioned, these are kind of like uh, time points that have a reference. And so what happens when you subtract uh, two decibel values? So if you tr uh, subtract a dBU from a dBU, so you, uh, you just have decibels. So the relationship uh, between, so imagine uh, thinking in our digital world for a second, if you have a like maximum digital level signal at zero dBFS, and you have another signal that's negative six dBFS, the uh, distance between those values is six decibels. And that's true whether it's dBFS or dB um, LUFS for loudness units or dBV. Um, the differences are always these relative decibels. So you see when I subtract a dBU by a dBU, I um, just get decibels. Um, you'll see in purple, adding two decibel values doesn't actually probably make sense. Uh, similar to like adding two dates doesn't make sense. You can add a amount of time to a date, but you can't add 
uh, April 4th to December 30th. Like, how would you even do that? So similarly, you can subtract decibels to get a relative value, but adding them probably does not make sense. And so that's a typo below. The purple line should be the plus it's wrong, and the white line below for dBV uh, should be right. And But the real question then is, um, if you have this relative decibel value, should I be able to add that to any decibel? So if I have my, um, in the example I mentioned earlier, if I subtract two dB um, FS values digitally and I end up with a relative decibels of six, is it okay to add that six decibels to six decibels loudness units full scale? Probably yes. Again, an open question for discussion. If anyone wants to nerd out on decibels with me later, um, I'm happy to talk about this, lots of ideas, but this is the question mark down below is, you know, should you be able to add a relative value you got from one unit or measurement of decibels to another one? Probably yes, but there's reasons in, a, we're talking about our audio world, like dBFS versus dBLUFS. Yeah, probably we can, you know, throw around the relative values between those, but if we had our, you know, six um, decibels that we got by subtracting dBFS values, does it make sense to then add those to decibels meters or some other um, power line measurement? I don't know. Open questions. Um, and so another kind of um, thing you need to keep track with with decibels is there's two um, types of decibels, as you see um, down below, where we're kind of multiplying by 20 or 10, is that there's uh, decibels that are representing a power value or a root power value. So um, going back to our examples of level and uh, power, you see that we have, um, if we have some API that takes a quantity of PCM, so that's our digital sample level value, and if we have a um, level zero, uh, a reference level zero in PCM, and a reference uh, power P0, that's a one power PCM as our two references, and then we say, let's say we have two levels. So we have a level L that's uh, 0.9. Uh, that says volts there, but that should say PCM. I'm sorry about that typo. Uh, and if we multiply that level by a level, we get a power. And you'll see that um, if we use L in the first equation, 20 long 10 L over the level reference, um, we get dBFS. And that's representing a root power value. But if we did it with 10 times log 10, our power P over the power reference, um, again, it's still dBFS, um, but we don't want that to be able to be passed to set level. Like before, this, the D, uh, calling set level with dBFS root power, we want that to work because of power, but if we call it with set level that's not a power, does a square root automatically happen? So uh, in summary, we kind of have a number of challenges with decibels. It's, we have to figure out they're special with other units because they have a reference value. When you have relative measurements between decibels, can you share those between decibel types, and how do we deal with power and uh, root power quantities. Um, very quickly, I'm going to kind of blow through some of these slides. Um, you can look at them later for your reference so we have time for questions. Um, but um, this is kind of an example of, like, of a hand-rolled decibel type, not supported by this MPU and library that we've used uh, internally that started some of these discussions with some of my colleagues about how to handle decibels, and you'll see there's kind of some operations that make sense, like you could add an arbitrary scalar value to a decibel or subtract it, but you see here, as I mentioned before, the only operation you can do on two decibel full scale values is subtract them from each other. <coughs> and yeah, as I said, you can add the scalar values. And whether this adding the scalar value should just be a, a float, um, like it is in, in MP units, is something we've been also kind of uh, having some internal debates about. And again, you know, this is um, showing an example of how you can define decibels and root power. Uh, and again, you know, how that relates to, you know, only being able to scale a root power by something else. So it's a question of, like, um, really, if you're, if you're adding something to a decibel value, you know, really that can just be a float. But in our root power example, the relationship of, you know, um, if we take a power gain and uh, multiply it by a level, that gives us a root power level. So um, there's other questions about, you know, should all the math that we do in decibels like freely convert back and forth uh, between the other types? Um, it's a very complicated um, situation. And I think we're going to talk about FFTs next. Uh, 
I'm not really sure. Maybe those slides came out of order. I'm not really sure. I apologize for that. I'm not uh, quite sure. I guess this is what happens when you uh, fill in last minute without rehearsing. But anyway, um, Oh yeah, I think actually the only thing to share here is I think doing a is another area I want to explore is what happens when you do a Fourier transform and like often we're dealing with third-party APIs that um, and that's actually what we'll see in the next example is you know um, Apple and Intel have libraries for doing fast math operations and you can use those for um, calculating things like Fourier transforms but. Um, you're going to lose all of your unit stuff again when you go into these fast math libraries provided by the platform. So how might we look at some of this using these fast math libraries by wrapping them with a third-party API? Um, uh, let's quickly look at, I'm just going to kind of sh very briefly show this example so we can leave the last five minutes for questions. But um, imagine we wanted to uh, take some processor that's operating on floats, um, but we want to make it strongly typed. This was what it looked like to make a processor that um, kind of, if you have some API you need to implement that takes just uh, raw float buffers, you can implement that as something that takes a strongly typed processor that um, takes sample quantity. So um, kind of leave that as an exercise to the reader to uh, look at this later. And then here's an example for um, the, you know, these fast math operations. So imagine we had some like, uh, function for adding a constant to a buffer um, implemented just with standard transform instead of some uh, platform stuff. We can uh, turn that into type safe versions of these like this. And the resulting code uh, that users would write um, uh, would um, end up looking like this, where you could take an array of floats, and um, this is what it would look like with uh, out using strongly typed units. And this is what it would look like when you are using the strongly typed units, a little more verbose, but hopefully not too bad so that it works out well and our you know, DSP engineers are happy with the safety and not uh, disappointed about the um, extra verbosity there. And other examples, I'll let uh, kind of implementation details that we can, we can look at later so we have time for questions. What's next? Um, just so you know, all these examples do work in Xcode for 15 with Apple Clang. Um, there's also an AU library you might want to look at in the meantime. I'm continuing to work with the library authors on um, figuring out how decibels and all these audio units might work, experimenting with FFTs and complex numbers. And um, this is not by me, but I'm a co-author on the first paper. We just actually had uh, reviewed at the uh, Kona standards meeting three papers about this proposal. Um, they're interested. There's a lot more work to do. Um, but I encourage you to check out the library and... Um, if you try it, you'll see in the examples there's a compatibility macro you need to use because we're not quite at all of the implementation of the modern C features we need. And thanks for some of my colleagues for a lot of internal discussions about units and for Matthias for helping me prepare for this talk and writing the library. Thank you very much. Right.